Thanks be to God. A while back, I was introduced to the idea of a uh, group of bias tests through a course I was taking. And for these tests, you look at the screen, and either images or phrases are flashed up on the screen. And on the keyboard, you have to hit either the E or the I, depending on the instructions that you're given. You have, to, you have to hit the, the E or the I as fast as you can as soon as you see the, the images fly on the screen. And through the reaction time, the program is able to tell if you have an implicit bias for one thing or another. And you can test for implicit biases for a lot of things, whether it's race, gender, religion, job, role, etc. And when you look at a multicultural society, it's it's important to realize that we all have mm -hmm. implicit biases. One implicit bias that many people have is a leader of the mm -hmm. Think of politicians or uh, people who are planning on going into politics or uh, maybe business leaders. Often they'll have consultants or stylists, people around. 
120 years of oppression. The people called out to God, and he delivered them. Again. In the other story in Judges, we read that God raised up a, a leader, he raised up someone to help. But in today's passage, we meet Deborah, who was already in place. She had already been leading Israel. She was giving God's word to the people and settled the disputes. Now, we don't know how long Deborah had been leading Israel, but it seems that she was established and people were going to her. They knew that they could go to her if they had things that needed to be settled. Imagine she wasn't really seen as much of a threat to Jada and Sisera. She was probably looked at it as being pretty harmless. She was a woman living in her tree who could talk with people. She probably helped keep the peace among the people, which, if she was settling the dispute, it was best for Jada and Sisera to have to deal with. But the people were still being oppressed, and after 20 years, they called for help. And God was still called. God spoke for Deborah. She called for Barak to tell him that God would use him to defeat the giants. Now we don't know much about Barak either. He was from the tribe of Asherai, but was a smaller tribe. He also wasn't very confident. Instead of believing that God had chosen him to lead the Israelites to battle, he said he was hoping to do so. Deborah went to him. Now this could have been a test. Similar to what Gideon did, wanting to know for sure that God was the one who was leading him. Or it could have been a lack of faith. He went to see Deborah as a physical representation of God. And like other times in the Old Testament, the people wanted that physical representation of God with them during the past, during battle. Think of times when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into battle because. People wanted to be like every other nation around them, where they had a physical representation of their God with them in battle. They thought that if the army could see a God, then they would win. So the Israelites were also tempted to do the same thing. So Deborah agrees to go with Barak, but she also tells him that because of his doubts, the battle would be won by the woman. Now, so far in the story, Deborah is the only woman who's been introduced to, and she's already the leader of Israel. You might think that Deborah would be the one who will have the honor of winning the battle. But Barak takes 10,000 men from the tribes of Deborah and Asherah, along with Deborah, to go to battle. They go out to meet Sisera with his 900 iron chariots and his army. But Israel, the Israelites have gone on their side. And then never told Barak to go and that God has already defeated the army. He left the army and he believed he defeated Sisera and his army. Now Sisera sees his army being defeated and he realized that his iron chariots were now holding him back. They were a detriment rather than being helpful. So he abandoned his chariot and he fled to the outpost. And here we need to declare the main character of our story. They are the wife of Hubert and Kenneth. Now, the Kenneth were a tribe with connections to the Israelites, but they weren't the Israelites. Deborah was the father in law of Kenneth's career, which more than he was in a family connection. But now it seems like Hubert has decided to tie in with the with Jada in his evil scheme. So, this work here seems like a safe place for him to hide. And even better, a better place to hide is the tent of a woman. She was uh, sort of one considered all that important, so nobody was really interested in there. And she seemed to have very well, too. She invited him in, other men wouldn't like it, and when he asked for a drink of water, she gave him a drink of milk. After all the fighting and the running, he must have been exhausted, so when he was warm and comfortable, he had something to drink, mm -hmm. he fell asleep. Not worried that anything would happen to him, because in his mind he was with people who were on his side. And we don't know what went through Jael's mind. We really don't know anything else about her. We don't hear anything about her life after this story. But instead of letting Sisera sleep peacefully and sending the Israelite army on a wild goose chase, she takes a tent peg and a hammer and a horse. 
then when the rock had come by, she points it out where the people and she was having to sell some that was where it's at. And it was like completely defeated David and lived in Ecclesiastes for four years. And to be honest, the book of Judges is very, very good. If you think about it, it actually like how the words rest in the line that says, if you get to what actually happened in the book of Judges, it's like not nice all the stories. And if you think too hard about what like, JL is this as well, I got to just agree with that. Um, but it can be quite uncomfortable reading these stories. And if you think about it, if it was made into a movie, um, it would have probably a very high rating if it would not be allowed to go to the movie because no one wants to like avoid the movie because of the um, violence and war. And because of this, some people say that it's not necessary to read the, the Old Testament anymore. Because the Old Testament shows an uh, angry and vengeful God. Or they say that it's not necessary to read the Old Testament because all the prophets and everything that was written in the Old Testament were fulfilled by the Jews in the New Testament. But if we stop reading the Old Testament, if we stop reading these stories, we miss a great deal about who God is. Because as brief as the book of Judges is, it shows us an awful lot about the grace and mercy of, of God. It shows us a lot about how God keeps the pressure. And it also shows us that God works for very ordinary people. God's grace is evident in this story and throughout the book of Judges. As he does with the Israelites time and time again, even though they kept on turning away from him. The pattern of behavior through all the chapters of Judges is that the people renew the covenant with God, they live in peace for a number of years, then they decide that the nations around them look pretty good, and they start following other gods and worship them instead. God sends an army to oppress them. The people cry for help. God sends a deliverer. The army is defeated. The people live in peace. They're just reduced. And it doesn't matter how many times the people disobey God and do their own thing. When they cry for help, it's always the peace. Many times, we don't see our call for repentance or a cry for repentance. We just read that they cried for help. It's just a powerful thing to remember. Sometimes we think that we need to have eloquent prayers. We need to say the right things for God to listen. But very often, He just listens to our heart. Even when we don't have the words to consciously say what we want or what we need, He listens even when we cry for us from our heart. And every time the Israelites called for help, God answered and gave them the truth of the Lord. We aren't all that different from the Israelites. They looked around at all the other nations and they wanted to do the same thing. They wanted the statues, they wanted the same types of worship, they wanted the physical presence of the king. They wouldn't, they, they couldn't trust somebody that they had to see. We can also look around us at our friends and our neighbors and be attracted to what makes what makes them happy. We want what other people have. We want to do the same things that other people do, even though we don't do the things that go with that. How many of us have become frustrated with other people, maybe with children or family members who don't listen to us or who don't learn from our mistakes? I know I do. I sometimes get frustrated with my, my children when they don't listen to what I tell them, even though I can tell them to do the same thing over and over and over again. I'm sure there are many others here who have similar experiences. But when I get frustrated with my children for not listening to me and doing what I tell them not to do, I remind myself that God does the same thing to me. It can sometimes be painful to look back over our lives and see all the ways that we need to live our lives in line with what God wants. We haven't always been 
loving kind to everyone around us. We haven't always spoken with compassion or protected our thoughts for us. We haven't protected the vulnerable or stood up for the be oppressed. I can go on and on, but even though we haven't always lived up, lived up to God's demands, He always forgives us and shows us grace and mercy at one point. Pastor Doug Matt says, in the face of his life or our unfaithfulness, God always remains faithful. And like in the Old Testament, God sent his deliverer to Jesus Christ. We know that he has to do And even though none of us are perfect, God still wants to model every day to go like him. We see that in our story today. God doesn't always work through the strong warriors. He also works for those who are considered less than. Although generally the prophet says to the leader himself, also we have been considered unusual because children were not as highly regarded in society at that time. But God was an unusual for his place in these nations. Barack wasn't a warrior either. He oh. knew God's word, and yet God works for him to create such a technologically advanced army. He didn't even have all of Israel behind him. He had 10,000 men from just a couple of tribes, and not even the largest tribes. We don't usually hear too much about the tribes of Nathalie and Nebula, but here they are instrumental in bringing the Israelites to the Jael wasn't even an Israelite, but even though she wasn't part of God's chosen people, she received the honor of defeating the enemy that Barak fought with the Israelites. Through Jael, God shows us once again that the covenant that he made with Abraham is for the whole world. God wants all people of all nations to experience his grace and mercy. And he brought in different people from different nations to be part of his story. Rahab and Ruth were also not Israelites. But they became part of the Israelite story and the ancestors of Jesus. Right from the beginning, God's story is not only for the Israelites, but for the whole world. He didn't work for only a specific type of person, but he works for ordinary humans in that place and time. And he still works for ordinary people. He works for each one of us in the places that he puts us. It might not always look like what our implicit biases say as a preacher or a missionary or someone who shares God's word with us. But God doesn't have a specific look or type of body. He's shown his grace to us over and over again, and he wants us to share that grace with others. And he's put all of us in a unique position to do so. When I was in Bible college, one of the questions that students agonized over again was whether or not they were going to go into the job that God had truly called them. This especially became uh, more disastrous in, in our last year, just before we graduated. And some students became paralyzed at the thought of having to choose one job or, or make one decision over another. Because they were worried that God only had one path for them. And if they chose wrong, then their salvation would be at stake. And it's the salvation of all those others who God was going to take their path. And what, what these people lost sight of was that God was already at work in the world. And He uses us wherever we are. Yes, if it's a choice between something that's God honoring and something that's not God honoring, then you should probably choose the God honoring one. But if all these decisions honor God, then God will work through all of us, no matter where it comes from. We don't have to be pastors or teachers or missionaries. We just have to be open to God's leading wherever we're, wherever He places us, whether that's a student in school, whether that's in business, whether that's using your hands in trades, whatever it is. God uses us even when we feel unprepared, when we have doubts, when we don't, when we feel like we don't belong. As God was already willing to give us a response. 
Thank you. 